Hey folks, Ms. Gosling here. In this video, you're going to learn how to solve launched projectile motion problems. By the end of this video, you'll be able to define projectile motion and apply the kinematics equations to projectile motion problems, with our keywords being define and apply. So let's go ahead and move forward. So projectile motion, again from our previous video, is any situation where an object is pushed or launched into the air. And in this video, we're going to be really focusing on that launched part of it. So what we're going to be looking at is situations such as, for example, a football player kicking a football into the air, where the football is going to start with some sort of some velocity that is horizontal and some that is vertical. We could also look in this situation at, for example, a nice old school cannon launching a cannonball. Um, or we could look at somebody with a t-shirt launcher launching a t-shirt into a crowd at a basketball game. So all of these are different situations where objects are getting launched into the air. And in all of these situations, our objects have both an initial velocity in the x direction and an initial velocity in the y direction. So in order, what we're going to want to do is break up our initial velocities. So in our previous video, we had all of the initial velocity being in the x direction. Now, some of it is in the x direction and some is in the y direction. And we have to figure out which is in each part of, is, is in each direction. So our accelerations are the same because in free fall, our acceleration in x is always going to be zero and our acceleration in the y direction will always be negative 9.8. But now what we're doing is we're breaking up our initial velocity u into an initial x velocity, which I call here u of x, and initial y velocity, u of y. And what I've done is I have said that if our initial velocity, u, is at an angle theta from the ground, then our x velocity is given by u cosine theta. And I can see that looking at my picture here, where I know that cosine of theta is equal to my adjacent side, which is u of x, over my hypotenuse, which is u, giving me this equation that you see here, u of x is equal to u cosine theta. Doing the same thing on in the y direction, I can write that u of y is equal to u sine theta. And so what I'm going to do again is one of my first steps in all of these problems is going to be breaking up my initial velocity into my x initial velocity and my y initial velocity. And honestly, this is the main difference between launched projectile motion problems and dropped ones. Instead of saying u of y is zero and u of x is u, we have to break up that initial velocity. So let's do an example, because I always find that these things are easier to see when they're done in examples versus talked about in the general term. So what we have is we have a stone that is launched off a cliff at a 30 degree angle and with an initial speed of three meters per second. And the stone landed 100 meters away from the cliff. How high is the cliff? So let's go ahead and draw our picture. So here is our cliff, and here is our stone, and it is launched here with an initial speed of three meters per second at an angle now of 30 degrees from the horizontal. And our stone is going to go up for a bit before coming down and landing 100 meters away from the base of the cliff. And our goal is to figure out how high the cliff is. So we want to figure out how high that is. And of course, my first step will be writing that Suvat table in the x and y directions. And you can see here I'm making my Suvat table a little bigger, and that is to give me some extra space for my initial velocity. So starting out with our givens, we know that our acceleration is zero in the x direction and negative 9.8 in the y direction, because that is always the case as long as we are on Earth. I also know now that my initial velocity in the x direction is three times the cosine of my angle, so three times the cosine of 30, and in the y direction, it's 3 times the sine of 30. Now, this looks weird and scary, but 
3 cosine 30 and 3 sine 30 are actually just numbers. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to write 3 cosine 30 up here. And uy equals 3 sine 30 also at the top because I want you to remember how I got my numbers. But I can go ahead and I can erase the values here and I or the erase the expressions here and just put in the values. I'll put them in my calculator. Um, and what I get is that 3 cosine 30 is approximately 2.6 and 3 sine 30 is 1.5. So that is what I'm going to want to put in my equation because those are much nicer numbers to deal with than um, my than these ugly expressions. So next, what I want to do is add this 100 meters away. We know that 100 meters away from the cliff is my displacement in the x direction. So that is going to go ahead and go in the x direction of my subot table. And finally, I know that I'm trying to find out how high the cliff is, which is of course going to be my displacement in the y direction. And per usual, I do not care about my final velocity in either direction. So what I'm going to do is you can see I have three pieces of information in the x direction, one, two, three, and only two in the y direction, one and two. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use all that lovely information I have in the x direction to figure out my time. And then I can go ahead and put that value in my SUVOT table in the y direction and use it to find my displacement in y. So let's go ahead and do that. So I'm going to use that same equation I was using in the earlier video in the x direction and I'm going to say s is equal to ut plus one half at squared because that is my only equation without my final velocity. s is 100, u is 3 cosine 30 or approximately 2.6 t is what I'm trying to find. So that'll stay as a variable. And to that, we will add 1 half times 0 times t squared. And we can, of course, get rid of that equation because, or of that term because 0 times anything is 0. So our equation simplifies really nicely to 100 equals 2.6t. And what I can do is divide both sides by 2.6, giving me t is equal to 38.5 seconds. And what I'm going to do is plug that in to my y Zubot table. So I now have 38.5 seconds, and that gives me a third piece of information, which will allow me to figure out my unknown. So what I'll do is I'll use that same equation, because again, I don't know v, and I don't care about v. So what I'll say is that s is equal to ut plus 1 half at squared, and that will give me s is equal to 1.5 times 38.5 plus 1 half times negative 9.8 times 38.5 squared. And guys, I do want to stop here for a moment and just give you a disclaimer. All of the problems that I've done so far have had a um, have had us use the same equation because we have not been trying to find any velocities yet. You may be asked to find your final velocity. Um, so just want to make sure that you guys are all aware of that as we go forward. So caveat aside, let's go ahead and finish this problem. So this looks ugly, but really all I need to do is multiply everything out. So that is what I'm going to do. So when I multiply my first term out, so that 1.5 times 38.5, I get 57.7. And from that, I'll subtract my second term which when multiplied out gives me 7,249. And when I add those together, what I get is that S is equal to negative 7,190 meters, or that the height of my cliff is 7,190 meters, or approximately 72 kilometers high, which is a, or sorry, 7.2 kilometers high, which is, high but not terribly high. Um, so here we go. That is the end of this problem. Let's do one more before I let you go. And I know this is a long video. You're going to have to deal with that. It happens sometimes. So an object is launched at a velocity of 20 meters per second in a direction, making an angle of 25 degrees upward with the horizontal. What is the maximum height reached by the object? So let's draw my picture here. 
So here is my object and it is being launched at 20 meters per second at an angle of 25 degrees. And when you see that angle of 25 degrees upward with the horizontal, just assume theta is 25 degrees. Don't worry too much about the way that this is worded. And what I want to do is I want to find the maximum height reached by the object. So here is my lovely object. And what I'm going to do is fill out my SUVOT table for this guy. So here's my S U V A N T. And we want to fill that out for both the X and Y directions, just so I can put in any and all information I may have. So before I do that, what I want to do is I want to find UX and UY. And I know that the initial velocity in the X direction is going to be U cosine theta or 20 cosine 25 and you y will be 20 sine 25. And one thing I wanna mention guys is um, when you're doing these problems, make sure your calculator is in degree mode instead of radians mode. Um, whatever program you're using, make sure that your sines and cosines are being done in degrees instead of radians. That is one of the most common mistakes I notice with these problems. So what I'll do is I'm gonna make sure my calculator is in degrees mode and plug those numbers into my calculator. And when I do that, what I get is that my initial velocity in the X direction is 18 meters per second, and in the Y direction, it is 8.5 meters per second. And I can plug those into my SUVOT table. So I know that U of X is 18, and U of Y is 8.5. And I know they're both up because I know that the object is launched horizontally upwards. So I also know that the acceleration in the X direction is zero, and in the y direction, it is negative 9.8. Finally, I'm trying to find the maximum height reached by the object. And I really hope when you read those words, you had those alarm bells going off in your head. Because we know that at the maximum height reached by an object, A, we know that that is our displacement in the y direction. But B, we know that in the y direction, whenever an object reaches its maximum height, its velocity is zero. And so that you should remember from free fall. Um, so from that, that one dimensional free fall, um, those one dimensional accelerated motion problems. Um, and that gives you all the information that you need to find or that you need to have to solve this problem. And one thing that's particularly nice is we can actually ignore the entire X direction. And I can do this because I already have three pieces of information in the Y direction. And my unknown is also in the Y direction. I also know that time is my extraneous variable. And so I wanna find my timeless equation. Looking at my four equations, I know that it is the one that I've just circled, equation number three. So what I'll do is I will say, V squared is equal to U squared plus two A S. And I can go ahead and substitute and solve. So V squared is gonna be zero squared. U is 8.5, and that is gonna get squared as well. And we're going to add that to that 2 times negative 9.8 times s. So I know that 0 squared is 0. And when I put 8.5 and I square that in my calculator, I get 72.25. I'm a little ahead of myself. And I can also multiply my 2 times 9.8, and that gives me 72.25 minus 19.6s. And I know that it's a minus because of that negative side, negative sign. And what I'm going to want to do is add 19.6 to each side, 19.6s plus 19.6s, and that will give me 19.6 times my displacement is equal to 72.25. Finally, I'm going to want to go ahead and divide each side of my equation by 19.6. And that is going to give me S is equal to 3.7 meters. And there you go. So let's go ahead and go to takeaways. So first of all, when an object is, launch, is launched, you need to use trigonometry to break its initial velocity into its X and Y components. Second, in projectile motion, again, 
the x and y motion are independent from one another, except for at that initial moment where we have to break that velocity down. And then we know, of course, that our times are the same. So what I want to leave you with before I let you go and before I set you free to solve problems is, that I, don't, is I want to remind you that for our problems and for, or for these launched problems, the biggest difference between a launched problem and a dropped problem is with that initial velocity. So with a dropped problem, we don't have to worry about, um, we, we can say that all of our initial velocity is in the x direction, and so our initial velocity in y is zero. For our launched problems, of course, we can't do that. And what we have to do is just to start off by breaking our initial velocity into its x and y components, which is something that I'm expecting you guys will be hopefully very comfortable with by the end of the practice problems. So with that, I'm gonna set you free to solve some problems. Best of luck and happy solving.